Marco Codes. That's right. Today we're going to talk about Docker images. Two things specifically. Number one, how can we make sure the Docker build command runs as fast as possible? Number two, how can we make sure the resulting Docker images are as small as possible? And as you might have guessed, this is not a completely basic Docker tutorial, but more of an intermediate one. Enough babbling, let's go. First, let's start with some basics with a bit of background. I have a Docker file open here inside my IDE, IntelliJ IDEA. It doesn't matter what IDE or text editor you're using, simply open up your Docker file and a terminal window. Now, my Docker file is based upon the Eclipse Temurin image. It's simply an image which contains Java. Then we have an arg line here, which says the user when building the Docker image can pass in a jar file. Uh, by default, it's set to target slash any to do list or jar. And it doesn't really matter what it is. At the end of the day, this is the jar file which I want to run inside my container, which is my web application, right? Hence, line number three, we're copying the jar file to slash temp slash app.jar inside the container. We're also copying an index.html file to slash temp slash index.html. And the entry point for my container when I boot it up is to run java-jar, which simply runs my web application. That is my basic Docker file, right? What I would do now is I could go to the command line and run docker build, and then I would get my final docker image. What's not immediately obvious is that essentially every line inside your docker file will result in a different layer. Hold on, what's a layer? Well, let's find out. You can run a different command here, which is called docker image history, and you can see the specific history of, uh, of an image. I'm going to paste in the SAH uh, 25060 of the image because I didn't give it a specific tag. And then you can see a couple of things here, a couple of lines down here. At the very top, you can see the last line of my Docker file, which is the entry point, which is one layer. It's a zero byte layer because it's somewhat of a metadata layer. Then you have my index.html file layer, which is 181 bytes, which corresponds to the size of my index.html file. You have a different layer for my a new to do list.jar file, which is roughly 20 megabytes large. Another layer for the argument, zero bytes. And then you see all the previous layers that the Eclipse Temurin image uh, contains. And that's very important to understand that every single line here corresponds with the layer. Why? Let's find out. Imagine as part of your Docker file, you want to run for whatever reason, it's actually a bad idea to do it, but I'll show you nevertheless. You want to run apt update, just, you know, fetching all the latest and greatest package informations from your, in this case, Ubuntu repository. Then we're going to rebuild the image. And now I'm not just going to do it on the command line. I'm because I'm lazy. I'm just going to click the button here inside IntelliJ IDEA, build image for Docker file. I'm going to wait a tiny second. I can see my image was written. And then I can also see the layers inside IntelliJ IDEA here. And what I'll find out is that I have my entry point layer. I have my you know two copy layers up here, my arg layer. And here the layer where I'm running apt update, right? This line I added here which is, by the way, 50, almost 50 megabytes or 48 megabytes large, just by running a single command. Now, every time someone pulls my Docker image for deployment, whatever, they will get an additional 50 megabytes worth of layer size, which is not good. Even worse, you might be tempted to do something like this, where you run apt update and then apt install my SQL server. And then at the end of the day, you think, well, let's delete these package caches that up apt update fetch before. So now let's try and run this and let's see what happens. Now let's inspect the layers. You can see entry point copy copy, that is all fine. Um, my SQL server pulls in an additional 602 megabytes, whoopsie. And the interesting thing is even though we deleted here with this uh, rm-rf line, the downloaded caches, layers are additive meaning you will still pull in the additional 48 megabytes of you know previously fetched um, package indices even though you delete them later on and they won't be available uh, inside your container you still have to download them so just bear in mind layers are always additive and you cannot just you know simply remove stuff from you know previous layers is there kind of a fix for that yeah there is what you will simply do is you chain together these commands into one run command like so and then you execute all of these commands as part of just one layer and then will benefit from, you know, a really tiny 
<laughs> layer size of well still the 600 megabytes of mysql server but at least the 50 megabytes of downloaded indices are gone let's have a look that's right you can see now there's only my 603 megabyte layer for mysql server but the 50 megabyte one is there now the quick fix was to chain these commands and make sure to have just one run command where you just do an apt update, apt install and delete the caches. The bigger picture is you want these builds to be reproducible. So you don't just want to install some, any sort of MySQL server. Ideally, just, you know, pick a specific one, MySQL server, and then add whatever that number is. Even better, don't just, you know, run random updates here inside a Docker file. Make sure to base your image upon a base image, which, um, well, that sounded a bit weird, which already includes, you know, all the previously installed uh, software that you need. And then you will make your build blazingly fast. This brings us to another topic, layer order matters. Let me show you how. Imagine I copy my index.html file to its target location at the very beginning of the Docker file. And then I'll just add a couple of characters to that file. Now, let me just try and rebuild the Docker image. And that took almost 20 seconds. Let's try it again. Let's add a couple more letters here. And then again, do another build for the Docker image. Let's see how long it takes. Another almost 20 seconds. The reason being is as soon as you change one layer here, even if it's just a couple of letters, you have to rebuild all the subsequent layers, meaning every time I now change my index.html file, I have to run apt update, install the MySQL server, delete the caches. This is why it takes so long. And that's obviously not what you want to do. Hence, you'll want to make sure that files that change often go to the very end of your Docker file, right? And when I now add a couple more letters here, and I'm just gonna rebuild my Docker image, you can see the build is done in 0.5 seconds or 0.4 seconds because that's the only layer that effectively changed. And that's a huge speed up, which brings us to the golden layering rules. Everything that is kind of network intensive where you install software and whatever, you want to, as I mentioned before, either put it to the top of the Docker file or move it to a base image. The same goes for lines or layers that never change or rarely change, put them towards the top. Files that often change, put them towards the bottom of the Docker file. And the same goes for ENV or CMD or whatever have you metadata instructions, also put them towards the bottom of your file. This brings us to the topic of layer caching because Docker is actually trying to be smart about what layers to rebuild. It figured out that your index.html file change and that's because it has a look at your files and uh, it hashes them and then sees if the if the hash differs right if that's the case then yes docker will try and rebuild the layer and this is true for the copy commands or for the add command for example if i added a new uh, command here at the end and i'll just you know want to delete the whole world then docker would also figure out hey the user changed the entire command here hence this layer will be rebuilt there's a couple more rules and I'll link the official documentation down below so you can figure out when and where Docker will and how uh, cache layers. This brings us to the last two topics. Just quickly, Docker ignore, what's it for and why do you want to use it? Well, the thing is when you run Docker build and you put in the current directory, what do you actually say? The build context is my current directory with all the files in it. And then you send your directory tarred up to your Docker daemon, which either runs locally, which means you do some file copying locally, or if you build remote Docker images, you send all the files you locally have to a remote machine. And that by default makes things a bit, you know, slow. The Docker ignore file, make sure to only spend spe send specific files or directories to your Docker daemon for the building. So for example, you know that you know, for the build process, you never really need the .github folder, for example, the .idea folder, .maven folder, whatever you have inside the project. So simply put them inside Docker Ignore, and then that will speed up things. By the way, also, if you work with something like NPM, you could try out uh, Docker ignoring your node modules folder here, 
meaning that you would rather run npm install during the build process and not copy potentially stale node modules you know inside the container which is also a bit slow just give that a try and while we're talking about dependencies being used during building of my docker image let's talk about the final topic which is directory caching this is very independent of the language ecosystem you're using. So if you ran npm install, or if you were using Gradle W build, if you if you did build a Java project, um, but maybe I'm gonna give a shout out to the Python people uh, watching here, which means I want to run pip install, and I'm gonna specify my requirements, requirements text file, where I'm specifying all the dependencies my project needs to be built. Now, once this layer here is being rebuilt, pip will need to download or re-download all the dependencies from the requirements.txt file. Why is that? Because there's no notion between the builds of, you know, caching these dependencies it has already downloaded. And in case of pip, um, the dependencies will end up in a .cache folder, if I'm not mistaken. We already talked about no modules. In terms of Java, I would have a .m2 folder. So the specific folders where usually build tools cache the dependencies. Luckily, there's an addition to a Docker file you can use where you can make use of these cached folders. And this is what it looks like. You have to specify a mount flag to the run command, type equals cache, and you have to specify what folder should be cached and be available for future builds, right? Um, as we mentioned, pip, puts downloaded dependencies into the .cache folder. The current user is root, and I put target equals slash root slash .cache here, but you can put any folder you like here. Now, every time you run pip install, what's actually gonna happen is that pip will only download the dependencies it hasn't yet already downloaded. For example, when you add one tiny dependency to the requirements.txt file, pip will only download this very specific dependency instead of the whole file. Again, a huge speed up. And as I don't have a Python project up here, I can't run this command at the moment, but try it out yourself and see how good it works. That was it. There were even more topics, like for example, multi-stage builds. But if you would like to see a video about those, uh, leave me a comment down below. Otherwise, see you next time. Sayonara.